Hey everybody, welcome back to Up The Vibe. And today I'm joined by Jay Anderson, who is the founder and host of Project Unity. Thank you, Jay, for taking the time to join me today. I followed your channel at Project Unity on YouTube for the last few years, and there's some really great interviews on there. Um, so really excited to, to speak to you today. How are you to doing? How are you doing today? You are most welcome, mate. Thank you for inviting me and I'm doing great. It was uh, a bit of a rainy day today, but yesterday was gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous in the UK, which is a rare thing. It was nice and sunny. So I went out for a massive hike and uh, and I've basically just been chilling today and doing a little bit of computer work. So yeah, happy to jump on for a talk. Oh yeah, great. It has been uh, mixed weather uh, recently, definitely. Um, well, but, you have uh, to yeah. you have to start you have to start a conversation with a fellow <laughs> British person by yeah. talking about the the rare occasion of sunshine in our country. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, but uh, firstly, I wanted to uh, talk to you about um, how you became aware of the UFO cover up and the vast trove of events that have occurred um, of occurred that in the mass sightings, the class retrievals. What what's your kind of history getting into this topic? Yeah, I mean, I, I came into it in a weird way, I suppose, which is why I've always given a lot of space for the, um, the the stranger aspects of the conversation that go beyond just the nuts and bolts and the idea of spacecraft and, and go a little deeper into the psychology and, and the, you know, the conscious implications and potential spiritual implications of uh, a subject like UFOs, because, you know, the way I came into the subject was inherently and, and you know, I'm always a little cautious when I say this, but it's the only way I can really describe it is that I came into it in an, in an inherently spiritual way um, through coincidences and synchronicities in my life. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of things kind of clicked into place and the path that I started going down in life just seemed to naturally end up with UFOs. And it, to be honest, it there was there was kind of like this this fundamental moment before I was interested in UFOs and I had been looking into kind of consciousness and, and quantum mechanics and different types of philosophies and ideas around, you know, like the big picture and stuff. I've always been someone who likes to think about the, the, the bigger ideas and implications of our reality. Um, always been fascinated by that since I was a kid, <clears throat> but there was a, yeah, there was a moment, I suppose, where my, uh, my best friend was like, Hey, you need to watch this, uh, this documentary. And um, there's a whole longer story, I suppose, attached to this because it also does uh, it's it's an it's a necessary part of the narrative that I use to talk about my experiences with the phenomena. We there was a long journey of of things that clicked into place that ended up with me in my back garden trying to project thoughts and trying to coax <laughs> something into, you know, uh, showing itself, which it actually did. And so this part of the story is also part of that. It's a it's a big component of that. Where my friend was like, "Hey, you need to check out this uh, this documentary by this guy called Doctor Stephen Greer." I know, and for some people who are not a fan, I, I get it. But I wasn't in the UFO community at this point, right? <clears throat> and maybe I'd seen a couple of clips or uh, you know a little snippet of a documentary, but I'd never sat down and watched anything. So this, you know, my friend was like, "Check this documentary out. It's called Unacknowledged," and I'll give it to Doctor Greer. This was a great documentary. You know, unacknowledged was really good. Um, came at it from the national security, black tech kind of aspect of it for the most part. But then near the end is where he suddenly starts talking about this whole thing called CE5. You know, the idea of making some yeah. form of contact through uh, a consciousness modality. And uh, I'm just going to clear my throat real quick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um yeah and uh and that for me was this really interesting moment because maybe like two or three weeks prior before my friend showed me this documentary i was sitting on my bed and i guess you could call it a prayer you know i'm not a religious person in that sense but i was just sitting on my bed and kind of saying out to the universe like oh, you know i've been and kind of absorbing all this information about different things about you know the implications of universal consciousness and the idea that quantum mechanics and the idea of a simulated universe could be a spiritual aspect of some larger you know larger awareness and all this really esoteric stuff but none of it applies to my life none of it <clears throat> none of it actually is helping me i don't know i don't know how to use this it's all just too esoteric so i was sitting on my bed and i was like Give me something I can do. Give me something that's real that I can actually do 
that applies to all this stuff that I've been learning that, that kind of makes it real to me, you know, all these concepts. And so I had sat on my bed, made that request basically. And then three weeks later, I get shown this documentary where near the end of it, this guy is saying, Hey, you can use consciousness to make contact and they'll turn up and, you know, lights will flash and stuff. And because of the, um, can you hear that dog barking? No, no. It's, it's okay. Fine. We're good. Cool. The, the microphone's doing its job. It's meant to isolate things like that. I've got a very yappy dog next door. I love it, but I it's very, will very, hear it now. It's, it's very small <laughs> and it's very loud. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, let me get back on track. So yeah. He, yeah. So this guy in this documentary, Dr. Greer is giving this idea of CE5 mm -hmm. and because of the request I've been making like three weeks prior about wanting evidence for these things like non-local consciousness or universal consciousness, suddenly having this guy say that this is possible because of the way it happened i think that's what allowed me to have successful contact because there was no doubt in my mind there was no doubt i'm still and i've given it a lot of thought afterwards and i'm still not sure what it was i saw whether or not it was a psychic projection from my own mind I, i'm not 100 percent. something happened like undeniably multiple times multiple times and I am not sold on the whole alien narrative 100% in, in, in regards to these contact situations, right? But what it showed me, what it demonstrated to me when I had these, when, it, when I had these events was <clears throat> that life itself, at least in my opinion, seems to have threaded within it some form of conscious medium that responds to you, that can be in yeah. some way influenced by you and that's what happened with me with these sightings of orange orbs you know that i don't know i don't know if you know about my experiences have you heard about them before i i think you've heard them on your channel yeah about the the orbs and um yeah it's uh i mean i i this is one of the things that you know attracted me to your channel was talking about c5 as well c5 is something that um i did and was actually probably in a way the genesis to this podcast because i kind of um got to know a few people within the c5 c5 community and um whether it's uh it's known i'm i'm officially the ce5 uk po podcast but um in some respects that is where um i got a lot of uh you so know, i'm in good guys, company so, then yeah i'm in uh, i'm in good company that's <laughs> yeah, good yeah. that's good to know it's good to know because it's a difficult thing to talk about and um <clears throat> you know i uh I, I genuinely try and, and come at this subject in an intelligent way because there's so much. Uh, can, do you mind if I curse lightly sometimes? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> there's so much bullshit, yeah. um, you know, in this uh, in this subject. And, and I think that that's what, you know, turns a lot of people off. And some of it's to do with intelligence community interference over the years. And, you know, narratives have been developed and propagated and built upon. And, you know, even for someone who's really interested, who's an experiencer, my God, I can I can really get put off the subject sometimes by just the the radical nature of some of the like hardcore believers who, you know, kind of have very bold statements about the overarching issue without any evidence. And I don't like that kind of stuff. I've always yeah. found that a bit frustrating. And and you know, I I understand my own position. I don't have evidence for what I saw. Um, I didn't even think about recording any of them. I tried later, um, but it never worked. And the times where I saw the orbs, I had no intention of filming, like none. It, it like you, you don't. I, I think when people haven't had an experience like that, it can be difficult to understand what kind of psychology is at play when you're experiencing that kind of thing. For me, it was just yeah. like a rabbit in headlights. Like I was just completely stunned, and all I could do was lock my eyes and keep looking for as long as humanly possible. Just keep absorbing what the hell it is I'm looking at. And there was no thought to even do anything, do anything else. Um, so I don't know if that's, you know, some people might say, oh, you know, it's a psychic phenomena. They lock you in as I, I think it's just a response to seeing something completely beyond your sense of normality, yeah, completely. I, I totally relate. Normal. And um, from my own experience, I feel that there is, um, there's a, there was a turning point in my own consciousness, a, a kind of a point where I started to, doubt my own belief systems to the right. point i was able Same. to to shed them and allow for new belief systems to come in and it was only at that point did i be, become to to grow beyond that and be able i guess to have these ex the experiences that i've had as well only came through when i was consciously ready and i think this points to why there are events happening 
and two people can be standing next to each other and one of them says i saw a ufo and the other one just completely goes goes a bit over their head in a way and yeah i think it's just it's not that um the universe is happening and we're all experiencing it we are the creators of the universe in a way we are creating how we understand it and it's our own where our consciousness is at is how we experience the phenomenon it's it's reflected i uh i agree i think people kind of get caught up in in that and say like oh well you know i experience a tree in front of me and you experience it so we're all <laughs> participating in the same thing but i think when it comes specifically to this anomalous phenomena that seems to exist on the fringes of reality it's not as easily observed and it does require a certain i don't know intuitive sense a certain shift in the brain chemistry a certain shift in your uh, ability to observe on the electromagnetic spectrum i don't know what it is but there's something I think, yeah that it, is, it, you i don't know. know if it is that there was a physical aspect to it but for me um there was a there was a kind of like you have to allow for your belief systems to be taken away and that is yes. a quite a difficult thing for a lot of people it's quite a fearful thing and you can sort of almost have empathy and um a sense of understanding for why some people are so reluctant to get involved in the subject because from my own experience i can see why getting involved may bring up some underlying maybe subconscious fears around losing their belief systems because it does shake them when you I start think, to see things differently i think there are a lot of parallels that can be drawn between a ufo phenomenon and a psychedelic experience you <laughs> know these are two very um very similar and and disruptive uh and and neural plasticity accelerating experiences in terms of they profoundly challenge your status quo they profoundly challenge your sense of normality and you know it's kind of like you either build or break that's kind of what happens right you either have a, a meltdown over the situation or you actually adapt and you go oh okay things were bigger than i thought they were things were brighter than i thought they were and now i need to adapt and adjust to this new normality and i think you know we see we see that and i think right now and i know that you probably uh resonate with this as well we, we're in a time even outside of just the ufo community where ideology and group think and ideological uh kind of rhetoric is is preferred to objective fact and information and discussion and i think that does play a role in the wider trying to understand the bigger implications of our reality there there is such a narrow-minded sense of consciousness that's projected onto us it's up to us to resist that narrow-minded sense of consciousness you know we're all capable of an expanded sense but the systems in play are continuously projecting in various forms a kind of form of consciousness suppression in different ways right through politics through social media through entertainment through all of the you know 24 hour news cycle this is all stuff that plays that role of refining our consciousness down into something where you can get these ideological uh, cults and groups and i think that impacts how people perceive reality and surely will impact how they perceive so-called anomalous phenomena you know yeah um i think it ties into to this the subject of whether you are someone who uh regularly re reads watches the news reads the me media and takes it as the source of information that leads you to make decisions or do you see it as propaganda coming out from a certain agency i think there's a there's a shift there as well in terms of your understanding of the information ecosystem that's been part of your life for so long and i think that was something that happened to me um actually when when covid happened because i was at the time uh when when it happened i was getting a lot of information sometimes through podcasts um sometimes through through twitter youtube and various things that showed a completely different narrative to what the news was telling me and it was difficult to find um uh, the, the the truth and i just decided that the news itself was projecting a, a fear-based message that i did not want in my life and 
I decided to turn it off and I've I've hardly watched the news ever since. Um, but a lot of people still watch it. Um, and then, you know, it's, I wonder that that's what plays a role as well. How, how you, um, how you use the information ecosystem and what, what it does to you in terms of your belief systems. Do you trust it? Do you, or do you just see it as someone's agenda? You know? <laughs> I, I mean, I've, I've always been uh, inherently anti-authoritarian uh, yeah. ever since yeah. school. I've always been like that. You know, I was, I mean, I was a smart kid, but I was a bit of a troublemaker and I'd always get sent out and, uh, I always had a, a a dislike of very disrespectful teachers who just expected us to listen, even if they were being, you know, uh, if I felt that they were wrong or they were behaving badly. So even as a child, and I, I you know, I, I was just a cocky little kid. I'd probably get annoyed with me as well when I, if I was a teacher. But I have maintained that level of of distrust and and dislike of authority, and. Um, I think when it comes to something like COVID, right, you know, when it first came out, I was like, oh, my God, man, this doesn't look good. <laughs> you know, this doesn't look good. Uh, what is happening in China? Oh, man, it's come over here. Oh, OK. OK. All right. I'll start washing my hands and I'll start, I'll start, you know, doing things to to mitigate the ability to catch this thing, right? And... It was when they rolled it's when they rolled out these uh you know things i don't even want to say it because yeah. I, I do worry about your channel um it was the like you said it was it was the level of um demand for compliancy absolute demand and <clears throat> um gaslighting like yeah. serious serious gaslighting you yeah. are responsible for your mother, your father, your grandparents. Do not be such a damaging person to society. How dare you even consider that you should challenge this? How dare you? How dare you think that you've got any right to challenge what we're telling you right now? And my problem inherently, mate, is when I hear that, I'm like, oh, <laughs> not me. Yeah, for me, I mean, I've... Um... I, I guess I, I wouldn't say I was uh, an unruly kid at school, but I've always felt a sense of of um, not wanting to be to be bossed around and be told told what to do. I've kind of wanted to make my own decisions. When with the whole COVID thing, I found it that it was scary how quickly <clears throat> a, a society that I felt was free, democratic and full of the progressive attitudes that I felt were needed in a, in a society that I wanted to live in very quickly turned to something not, not too far away from authoritarianism. Looking back, it's, it's scary to think how quickly that can happen. And I'm glad I don't feel like I'm in that world right now, but, um, yeah, it's, it was, a, it was an eye opener. Um, but we're, we're hopefully not going to see that again. <laughs> yeah well um i i don't know mate i mean, i think um you know it's it's a demonstration of just how fear when appropriately engineered mm -hmm. can have incredible effects on the malleability of human decision making and yeah. and i think it also runs in in, co uh, in collaboration with not wanting to be the outlier from a group not wanting to be the one that people point at and go hey why are you saying things different to us so you've got two things happening right you've got this incredible sense of fear which hit me initially right i was like yeah. oh, oh my god man okay time to kind of like you know let's let's think about this mm -hmm. it you know this this sense of fear which hit people to the point where they've not recovered they've not recovered they're still locked up in their homes with masks taped all over their heads and stuff you know they don't you know and and so the fear but it's coupled with this incredible mobilization globally of the media and the pharmaceutical and the medical health organizations yeah. so you have this like absolute wave of propaganda just coming out over and over so it's fear laden 
and it's also basically getting everyone to behave as a singular group and that's such a potent thing i mean seriously and i you know it, it was goebbels the propagandist for nazi yeah, germany i was, was going to say i don't i find you know, sometimes you, 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 a lie you start talking about the nazis you you, you wonder if you some people might turn off but i think well they can turn off if they want <laughs> but they shouldn't turn their brains off because no, you know I mean... it was it was it was goebbels who said that if you repeat a lie often enough eventually it becomes the truth <laughs> and you know this is yeah. the propagandists at work and that's what's happened here and you know i uh it, it's a real thing i think it came from an artificial means uh, you know i'm not one of those people that says it's a made up uh ep you know pandemic but i think it was either leaked or released from from uh you know uh at the lab and and uh i don't trust the way that they've handled it and i think before we move on to anything else i just think it's been a fantastic exercise though in watching how quickly so-called democratically functioning and, and and running governments will turn to what they actually want in this in the blink of an eye which is more authoritarianism more compliance more restriction more regulation of your life mm. that's what they ultimately would like and they didn't get it fully with this so yeah. i share your optimism it, hopefully it, it doesn't come, around come out again. having come out of it and sort of looking back do you still have the beliefs that they in the in these governments were thinking oh here's an opportunity to bring in our authoritarian control no not governments fear not, and not, was it a mixture it's not governments mate it's, it's not governments the, it's, the it's, government, it's, the it's, government. it's 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 world economic forum it's bill, yeah. bill and melinda gates foundation it's klaus schwab it's it's xi jinping in the ccp yeah. it's you know trudeau and it's the young global leaders it's it's the groups that monitor and regulate the groups that run the governments and yeah. that is a like, it is a shadow government but it's not in the shadows that's the thing that people need to let go of the shadow government yeah. bs it's not real the, the shadow government is in the light and it's called the world economic forum and these people run the world not 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 government it's corporate now most people know it's corporate data runs everything data is the main commodity if anything you know the you know the uh the microsofts and the googles probably have a, a lot more power in terms of leverage than governments these days they just don't have the military force they don't have the kinetic power but they have the data you know they have they have everyone by the by the digital balls <laughs> in, in a sense so yeah I, I don't think it's governments necessarily that are going ha 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 and yeah. I don't even think the people in the world economic forum are going ha 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 what it is is you know most people I would say even almost all people who do horrendously evil acts on mass they don't think they're doing something evil we no, might no, no, be doing something evil but they don't so weird you know when it, yeah. <laughs> when you've enabled when you've enabled a bunch of billionaire sociopaths who are obsessed with themselves and who think that they are the best because they've accumulated the most resources they have the right to dictate how you live they truly believe that they think it's altruistic they think they're looking in the long term as right well we'll, we'll carve out this utopian superstructure of a society most of you will have to die but that's fine because this thing in the future is going to be br brilliant and bright for the rest of us that they they think it's a justifiable sacrifice and that's what people aren't recognizing yet when you see them shutting down the farms in holland and you see them shutting down buying up agriculture all over the world they're literally seizing the assets that we use every day to further control us and people think that's conspiratorial and i find that hilarious because all of this is available on their website and it's just it's, it's evidential through their actions you know all of the people involved in the umbrella of the world economic forum are doing all of their pieces to kind of like further coagulate and coalesce power on a global scale so like yeah, I don't think it's government so much you have to worry about in in that sense. It's more it's more likely to be the maniacal billionaires who nobody voted for, who just think they can do whatever the hell they want to do. Yeah, you got me going on a rant now. Yeah, I'm on a rant <laughs> now. No, but it it is. I mean, you've you've explained very well um, where the source of a lot of the a lot of the issues that we see going on, um, but. I, I do question to myself trying trying to understand reality because we, when we try and look at other people we put ourselves in their shoes and we try and see ourselves doing it but in this this case I can't see myself acting the way they do so I'm trying in trying to 
understand how the world works and try and become a, a predictor of where things are going well i'm trying to know, understand are they living in a are they living through fear or are they living through power on greed what what are the emotions that's driving the force behind I, doing things which to us seem anti-human in a way <laughs> i mean i can't I, I couldn't tell you but yeah. i would i would almost argue emptiness i think that the people who <laughs> are expressing the most power and kind of flexing the most on the world stage in terms of the kind of like the the, the globalist billionaires and, and people like that that nothing's enough nothing mm -hmm. simple life with my god you know even six figures in the account i'd, I'd be happy i'd be very happy mm -hmm. a simple life they can't have it they can't they don't function that way evidently because they can't they, they can't hold on to that type of reality they're always going for more to the point where now they're you know firing rockets into space nothing's enough nothing's enough more 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 and hey look a lot of that drives innovation right people who are just driven by i have to keep going i have to keep going and a lot of that has driven innovation but i think that when you've given a lot of power to a, a bunch of power hungry billionaire you know kind of uh psychos who do have an agenda who want who have like a vision for how they want to see the world and it involves uh you know a, a very very controlled regulated global trade and, and economic system that's digital it's you know now they're pushing for the central centralization of of digital currency and uh you know the the steps are being put in place to essentially set up something that is in some ways comparable to a a chinese social credit score although i don't think we have lived in an authoritarian enough of a regime for them to implicate a social credit score in the same way as China without a lot of people suddenly going, no, it's time for a revolution. I, I would like to think so, at least, that if, they, if it got to that point, then that they would do that. But again, and this is an unpopular one, and people might go, whoa, what's he saying here? And it's not that I have any sort of uh, solid opinion on this, right? But the whole kind of climate change agenda... The problem with that is that it has the ability for people to jump onto it and use climate change as a means to uh, exercise more control over you, over you know, your carbon footprint. The billionaires that fly their private jets, right, all the time to places like Davos to decide how you live your life are going to make you suffer for your carbon footprint. Now, you can't tell me that's about climate change. It's not about climate change. It's about restricting your ability to do things, but they're doing it under the guise of something like, oh, you've got to help save the planet. You, you want to go green, right? But they're the hypocrites. They're the gas gut. They're the worst ones out of everyone, right? And they're the ones that put the systems in place to actually create such a big carbon footprint. So it's not fair to levy all of the blame onto us when it's them that are the problem. So that's always where I have an issue with they're using narratives. It's not that we shouldn't care about the climate. We should exactly, protect yeah. the green forest. We should protect the ozone. My God, you know, that's, but this is where people get all split up with it. They might hear me say, oh, you know, there's agendas attached to climate change. You go, oh, Jay doesn't want, and it's like, no, no, no. Of course we want to protect the world. Of course we want to do that, but listen to what they really want to do. Listen to what they're doing beyond just the message of sustainability or going green or build back better and all of this stuff. Look beyond the message, look deeper into what they're actually trying to do, and you'll see that it's 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 a Trojan horse. It's it's dressed up as something like climate change or, you know, some form of altruistic thing for the world. And it it's not. It's ne it never has been. You know, it never has been, has it? You know, the bill the billionaire globalist class. Yeah, they're always doing just fantastic things for the world. That's yeah. why world hunger is solved. We don't have world hunger anymore or human trafficking, right? Oh, wait, they're all happening and they're being created by those people. So, I, you know, I, I, at some point, I hope we get uh, to grips with that properly. And I don't really know what could be done about it because they are the most powerful. Let's be honest. So what do you do about that? I'm not quite sure. Well, we, we have podcasts where we talk about it. <laughs> um, raise awareness. I think that's what you can do as a simple yeah. average Joe is raise, aware uh, raise awareness, right? Um, yeah, but and also try and give our thoughts in a way that can be can be reasoned with. And, and the reason I say that is because I, I do find it difficult talking about the climate change agenda because it is very fused and a lot of people feel like yeah. you're now against... Uh, looking after the planet that's not the case at all i really want to look after the planet i just see um the potential for us as a global system 
amongst many other things, to potentially put all our time, resources, energy into stopping the uh, over uh, to control um, how much CO two is in the atmosphere and completely miss out on all the other things that we are doing to the world, where we should be putting our resources in terms of looking after the oceans and the forests and the habitats and and things that do matter and i agree with um and now i know that when people say oh climate change they are, they do often that's sort of an umbrella term for looking after the planet but actually to me no climate change is making sure that everyone is controlled in terms of how much co2 they admit which itself can be debated i think there are scientists on both yeah. sides of the aisle it's not settled that co2 is causing global warming but you know and that's the hard thing i'm not I'm not convinced by the science on that. And if someone wants to convince me, great, and may think I'm I'm an idiot. I haven't looked at the right articles or whatever, but yeah, I need but it's the same. It's, but it's, it's, there's an agenda. Definitely, it's the it's the same with with COVID, mate. Like I don't understand the science on climate change or on COVID. I'm not a scientist. I don't understand the science on electrogravitics, the things that I discuss when it comes to UFOs. It, you know, but what I you don't need. You don't need to understand the the science to observe the behavior and analyze the outcome and, and kind of look at what they're actually trying to do. That's what really happened to me with the pandemic is, you know, I'm not going to pretend to understand, you know, all the, the different kind of caveats of epidemiology and all that. That's ridiculous. All I'm looking at is, oh, why are all these doctors getting banned? Why are all these censorships happening? What you know, so it, it's you don't have to be a scientist to look at, for example, climate change. And uh, and just look at the people involved and go, oh, hang on, aren't they kind of mainly responsible? They oh, they're responsible for the climate change if there is, you know, some significant shift. It's it's their fault, and they're telling us we have to change yeah. our lifestyle for 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 a better outcome. Oh, okay, now I understand what they're saying. It's not about climate change, right? So there we go. So you know, yeah, it's just just deciphering the real meaning underneath this lovely little you know kind of charade and this bit yeah. of velvet they put over it you know that's all it really comes down to yeah um fascinating discussion and um all topics that very very dear to me but um i would like if to we haven't if you, know, if you haven't been banned <laughs> yet i'm sure this conversation will probably get you banned <laughs> well My i'll goodness. start the interview now hi jay <laughs> <laughs> no um so basically, uh, I wanted to talk about some of your interviews and more, most notably uh, the one with Bobby Ray Inman. I uh, found that one of the most uncomfortable interviews that I've ever watched, not because of the way you presented it, but just the body language, the chemistry, everything about it just seemed just there was there was an oddness to it that um, I wonder if you could shed light on how, what your feelings were during that and and uh, the <laughs> And everything afterwards yeah that was a weird one wasn't it it was a weird one i didn't expect to get it either you know i was really surprised when i got that uh <laughs> so you, this is the this is another thing right and i'll ju i'll answer what your question but this is another thing people um people sometimes think that you know for example i'm in the ministry of defense or i'm some sort of ic guy because i've managed to get quite a few people from mm. different intel or military uh, ranks on for interviews it's really um i mean there are have been there have been some special cases where i've known someone who's known someone and they've reached out privately and they've agreed and whatever but for example admiral inman and a lot of people were like how did he get admiral inman yeah. nobody nobody's got him how mm -hmm. dude his email address is online and his phone number. Um, he teaches at a university. I found his EDU page. You know, it's not that hard. Really not that hard. And so we called him up. And we had no answer. Left a voicemail. A week later, my colleague gets a phone call back from him. And it was this that made me think. It was this that made me think that the universe had aligned. And that this guy was going to spill the beans. Because he said... Oh, hey, um, you know, this is this is him and blah blah blah. I can't remember exactly what he said, but he said, This is a phone that I haven't used in over a year. I keep it locked in my cupboard, I keep it locked in my desk drawer. I just checked it on a whim and found your voicemail. I was just like, you know, 
it felt like <laughs> destiny had intervened so i was yeah, like yeah. oh my god like, you know this is gonna happen he's is he really gonna am i gonna get him to literally confess this on the record so i was really you know nervous about the about the interview and he's the only person honestly scouts on it he's the only person who's ever needed questions beforehand you know i've done i've interviewed lou and other people you know in the ic none, nobody's ever needed a pre pre-approved -pre uh set of questions or topics he wanted topic not questions topics like you know what are the themes that we're going to be discussing and that's another thing people think i tricked him i didn't trick him i might not have been completely as open about my interest like oh i didn't show him that i was you know like kind of low-key obsessed about ufos but i had put a whole list of themes national security and geopolitics the impact of china and you know eastern power dynamics as as we unfold like things i knew he'd be attached and inter you know attracted to giving his opinion on you know like oh i'll tell you how i feel about china and about russia and about this so i knew he'd be interested in that and i also put in the themes i think i'd worded it like the 2017 onwards ufo process and conversation in government and slash congress or whatever so he knew he knew i wanted to talk about ufos he might not have known specifically how deep i wanted to go but he he wasn't tricked he, he knew that it was going to come up right and, and he could have um, spent some time to research you and find out a bit more if he was you know worried or concerned so he did have the opportunity it says on his Wikipedia page, the spy master, if he had just done a couple of minutes of due diligence, I'm pretty sure he would have run like the coyote away from my YouTube channel because he would have become very clear that I had a singular interest in this conversation. So the rest of it was just, you know, uh, all due respect. If you're listening, Admiral, I do apologize. But, you know, the 90% the of the interviews... It's not about that. It's that ten percent where I, where I got on the UFO stuff. Like that's what I was. That's the whole. The whole thing was about that. And I knew I had to do like you know maybe like half an hour of other things first. It's tactics. You know, it's it's getting someone to relax a little bit, getting someone to trust you or be on that level of of like oh he's you know we can match each other and talk about these things so i was you know talking about the like like i said the geopolitical issues and wider global issues and he and he was relaxed he was sitting back you know he was reminiscing he was talking about this he was you know he was there la, 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 you know he, he was enjoying himself he, he was having a good time kind of telling me how he feels about these different things and this is what people picked up on and i emailed um there's a couple of them out there, but there's a really popular one where these uh, these body language specialists have a YouTube channel. They break down very famous videos or very important videos. Um, I sent them it. I'm going to have to send them again because I don't know if they saw the email. I'm, I'm really hoping they pick up on it because I feel like it's worthy of it. I feel like it's worthy. You know, it's such a high ranking guy at, 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 with such an incredible um implication of his level of involvement in this subject and like you know what his body language is telling us but even without being a body language specialist i mean the transition from relaxed to this was just you know the moment ufos came up and that I, you know a lot of bon body language specialists will say this is kind of a subconscious i'm not going to tell you anything i'm keeping it in i'm keeping it you know locked into my uh into myself it's a, it's a subconscious thing we do when we're holding things back we start actually mimicking the the thought that we're having that we're mimicking the the idea of holding back so yeah like when he when we got onto Bob Exler and reverse engineering and the implications of what he said to him, which he totally said to him a hundred percent, and you know I there are other people who have good connections in the IC who have said multiple times to me that Admiral Inman really right you know just cherry on top he's he's right there he's one of the guys he's one of the main guys, and I don't doubt that for a second. Um, why he came on i don't know i don't think he'll come back <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but it, I don't it, know. it was interesting to watch the body language uh, okay we didn't get any information but we we think we saw enough from the body language of he's not he's not saying he doesn't believe in ufos because he doesn't believe in ufos he's hiding something there was definitely <laughs> well that's the thing is going it's, on it's, in his head that, it's uh, um 
you know, it, it, I know it's not for like a court of law, but for me, and I don't know, maybe people will critique me on this. Like it's just my own personal thing. But for me, that is information. Like yeah. his behavior is information. Mm -hmm. it, of course, he's not going to full on say, yeah, Jay, I, I was there and I'm part of MJ12. Like, you know, he's not going to say that, but his body language his his refusal to you know his immediate yeah. when i when i brought up bob exler uh he acknowledged knowing him but when i said about reverse engineering no 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 ufos <laughs> there were no ufos absolutely nothing like that i can i, I have I have high confidence in that it's like dude like you know like all of that to me is information it's not what we want but yeah i i, I personally i would say yeah there we go got you <clears throat> You know, you know, and we know. You know something. <laughs> You're not telling the truth. You're not telling the truth, my brother. Yeah, yeah. Um, another wild interview. interview. Oh, wild interview. Can't believe that. And another interview which um, was quite notable was the one with Oak Shannon. Mm, and also, Oak. in particular, some of the fallout that happened around that. And someone I'm thinking about is Grant Cameron. Um, oh, man. That's all dead and buried now. No one gives yeah. a shit about that. Oh, well, I, well, the question I wanted to ask was hope things were okay and all squared up. And just, it was dead and buried, I guess. Oh, well, with, with, with GC, I've got <laughs> nothing but love for him, man. I've yeah, got nothing but love for Grant. He's a good guy. Like, he's a great researcher. Like, the whole thing was right. just a miscommunication, bit yeah. of drama, nipped in the bud, whatever. It's all good. You know, it's all good. At the end of the day, we're all in this for the same reason, right? We want to try and get stuff out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and following on from that, is there any um, update on the ongoing saga of the Ad Admiral Wilson notes and anything new on that sphere that you can be sh can be shared, or is it all pretty? I think <laughs> not. Not to toot my own horn, but I think the latest is is Oak Shannon. You know, the latest development of of the Wilson documents would be <clears throat> that you know he came out. He came out on the record, and I still think that that is a. Uh, you know that that alone is a very unique little data point to now have because um it becomes very difficult <clears throat> to say that this could be falsified when a name involved in the documents literally says yeah all the things said about me in those documents are true like they're all true so how do you get facts about someone's per personal things his health his his literal health at the time he had had a, like a major heart attack died on the operating table couldn't talk at the time admiral wilson said that you know it'd be really great if oak could be with us but he's got really bad heart issues linda told me on the phone linda who is his wife so like how do you get <laughs> how do you fake that like how do you sit down and write something and, and f that's like me knowing your name mate and then just making up a couple of things and they're like totally true and they're like personal things about your health and who you had a phone conversation with at some time. It's like, come on, you're, you're having a laugh. You're literally, you're joking, right? It's obviously real. Yeah. So, you know, the meeting, in my opinion, the meeting 100% happened. The documents 100% real. Eric Davis 100% wrote them. Whether or not what was said to Admiral Wilson is true is a completely different kettle of fish. That's a completely different conversation. The things that these apparent gatekeepers said to him, do they have that retrieved craft? Is it alien? Is it something else? We don't know. And I don't know if he was told the truth. He was also told that there's no abductions, that they're, that they're not real. I don't know, because I, I really don't have uh, like a kind of a vested opinion on uh, what really goes on with the abductions. It's a, a I just don't really have a strong enough opinion um, on what they really are. And so, yeah, I think that's really, if you launch it, if you honestly look at all of the different data points, and there are a lot of them, there are a lot of them, um, and you string them all together, you have a lot more on this side, legitimacy, than you do on this side, made up, script, story, fake, you know, whatever. There's just so much more on this side. And, you know, he, like, these... Like, <sighs> <laughs> oh, it's just annoying. Like, these like he, these people have all said it's real. Like, you know, the ones who are on the... Not Admiral Wilson, but everyone else. All the other ones. Like, you know, Eric, Hal, Lou, Gary. 
they're all on the same group man like they've all said it's real because they know it's real and they just can't say it because there's a literal national security implication involved with the classified information being trafficked to someone who shouldn't have received it which is eric davis who was the recipient of illegitimately traffic classified information which you should never have been given by admiral wilson mm -hmm. so like they can't ever say that until there's some sort of legislative process put into place which we're now seeing with the whistleblowers and the ndaa so you know who knows if that's actually been a mechanism that in some ways was set up with the intention of bringing that to the forefront and you've got to remember that um gary nolan spoke to and i've completely blanked on the senator's name or the congressman's name now which is annoying because i usually have it right there in my head but it's gone um he, he briefed on the admiral wilson documents before he went to question the two pentagon officials if you can remember his name tell me but um i'm gonna go through names um obviously there's tim bushettes on in there and, not bush uh, yeah. <laughs> um i don't know if it was warner who, yeah. who questioned the two pen you know what i'm talking about with um, um yeah, yeah. patrick and Moultrie when they're sitting in the in the pentagon oh, yeah, yeah. yeah 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 question about the wilson notes yeah, yeah, he messed escaping. it up. Mean, he yeah. messed it up. I think yeah. he said uh, Admiral Davis and Dr. Wilson or something like that. Yeah, I was like, oh, dude, and you had... they kind you... of blanked on it. Oh, I've never heard of that. Yeah. yeah, I was like, you had one job, bro. You had one job and you messed <laughs> it up. Thing is, bec thing is, you got to think of it this way as well, right? You got to think of it this way. The people he's questioning, they're Pentagon linguistic bureaucrats. He said the wrong name. So, of course, they're congressionally, you know, they're allowed yeah. to say, well, I've never heard deliver, of that. And I've, really think that. I've never heard of that. If he'd used the right bloody names, then they would literally have been lying in Congress. But because he used the wrong names, they weren't lying in Congress, technically. You know, and a, and a, and a lawyer could certainly prove that would be, you know, that's, that's thrown out, you know, cl closed case. So, it hasn't occurred to me, actually, that thought that it, it may may have been deliberate. I hope not. I really hope not. That would suck. If I I want to think it was a mistake. <laughs> I want to think it was a mistake, and I want to think they they didn't really know. But there is a part of my brain that goes, it's either like you know he made a mistake, and they went, oh, he's oh, the made a mistake. Side of me just jumped out there. I'll uh, put him back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So yeah, I mean, the, Who knows? What I, but what I'm saying, what I'm saying with the Wilson documents is, I think that they may. I think they may be used as a mechanism through Congress. I think a lot of, uh, well, I know a, a quite a few congressional people have seen the documents or are aware of the documents. Uh, you know, they've been inserted into the congressional record. Now you can literally go onto uscongress.gov and download documents about a DIA flag, flag staff director talking about reverse engineering. That's pretty nuts to me. That's kind of wild. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think I think uh, the Wilson documents and, and Oak Shannon coming out on the record, I think is the latest development with that stuff. And I wouldn't be surprised if they kept surfacing over the next year or two as things just kind of bubble around in Congress. And, uh, you know, we start seeing the hearings. Um, yeah, we'll just have to see. But I have a feeling that the Wilson documents are actually in some way an integral component of this structure that's being developed in government to handle this topic. It's right. almost like it's the, well, uh, you know, the smoking gun for reverse engineering. Well, talking about um, Congress and the developments, the hearings, you talked about Moultrie and uh, was it Kirkpatrick as well? I think so. I might be messing that up because no. Kirkpatrick's the guy that I think yeah, was head there. of yeah, 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 The thing is, there's so many names yeah. and so many acronyms, yeah. but I, I, I can barely keep up. Yeah, and there was an AIMSOG ridiculous nuffs. The oh, the, yeah. yeah. But do you think, um, especially with the recent developments coming from Senator Gillibrand, who said that the she came up and said, look, these are underfunded, and and we've heard about how little staff there is in the this new new office. Do you do you sometimes see um, that this could all be Project Blue Book happening again? <laughs> well, I mean, it's all a money making opportunity. You got to remember that as well. Like you know, like as much as we want to hold people like Gillibrand and Rubio and even Bushette and others on some pedestal, like they're doing it for their own political clout as much as, you know, they might be curious, which is totally fine. And I'm sure they are curious. You know, you'd have to be a bit weird to not actually be curious when you, you're getting to sit down with the pilots and you're getting to sit in those situations. Right. So that I'm sure they are actually curious, but uh, you know, there's a, there's going to be their own personal agenda. They're, they're 
politicians right so they're going to look for uh, ways to gain more funding for their own campaigns and ways to gain more of a, a you know a, a voting uh, demographic and all of that kind of stuff that that just comes with the territory but i don't know about blue book um look man i don't trust the government i don't trust the government i don't trust right. Um, you know, th this is another thing that I have an issue with with the UFO community in in general, and and I you know I don't want anyone to feel like I'm painting them with this brush, but there are certainly people out there that seem to feel this way, which is that you know the UFO secrecy issue is the only issue where the government can't really be trusted, and 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 you know they, they kind of toe the line on everything else. It's like guys, we are dealing with an inherently corrupt system, like not just. <laughs> You know, it's not the Democrats, the Republicans, like the system itself, the, the just yeah. the system, the, the basic foundations upon which this whole thing relies upon its survival is corruption and blackmail and, and all this like kind of like favors and DC back scratching and all that kind of stuff. It's all slimy and backdoor politics and it's not cool and it's not it's not good. It's not democratic. It's not free. And I just think that people need to recognize that when looking at something like the UFO subject, when looking at COVID, when looking at, you know, anything out there that's being propagated as a major talking point, we need to challenge, even if you agree with it. So like, we all want disclosure, right? We want, you know, we want major admissions from government, but you have to, you have to genuinely think about this, you know, is the US government Go and and that's a very blanket statement because we all know, and I think most people listening who are a part of this research community know it's it's not government moving as one, and most people in government haven't got a clue what's going on with this subject. Mm -hmm. But there's a very powerful little niche in different agencies and different aspects that kind of have a lot of influence on the way that this giant structure moves, and they can kind of stop things from coming out in the way that we want it to come out. Right, that's kind of their deal. So the secrecy state, the national secrecy state. So even if you enjoy and want to see you know, disclosure with a capital D, it's always going to be coming out in a way that's going to serve an agenda for you know the military industrial complex, the intelligence community. And that's not a good thing. That's not going to be a transparent disclosure. They're not going to just be like, okay, look, here are the answers that we've had for the last 70 years. You know, this is what we've understood. It's going to have a national security, uh, you know, imperative stamped onto it. It's going to have some sort of, you know, domestic and foreign policy agenda stamped onto it. It's going to be managed and controlled in a way that kind of allows them to maintain hegemony and allows them to maintain influence and especially allows them to maintain inordinate amounts of funding for the military industrial complex right so like i can never be like fully supportive of it because i don't think it's going to grease the right wheels i think it's just going to you know if we if we have a highly funded ufo program in the government okay like what's that gonna do i'd rather have a highly funded private research group do it i'd rather have a, an ngo do it than you guys in the national security state who have stolen people's inventions for the last 70 years and <laughs> profited off of it from the department yeah. of energy and you know the the uh the, the the invention secrecy act and all of this stuff like i don't want you in control of it uh, wh why why would we want the people who wage wars and lie to their people and i'm not talking about americans i'm talking about literally like the western world and i only say the western because i'm a part of it people get very weird these days i'm not saying i'm pro-east pro-russia pro-china but i live in the west so i can comment on the west yeah. and you know the western world is run by very dangerous powerful people so you know you just need to be very cautious about all of this stuff even if you want to see disclosure you have to be questioning the government narrative on it you really have to you know and you asked me something a while ago about listening to mainstream media like i'll listen to mainstream media i don't trust it i'll listen i'll you know I'll kind of analyze it and you hear the talking points you know if you really just train yourself you just you pick up on all these little talking points where where, where they're trying to steer you into a certain direction because that's the thing with the news it's not it's not that everything is a lie. It's not like the whole thing is a lie. They'll they'll show you a reality and then they'll embed little little kind of like nudges towards a it's certain narrative actually, of that. I reality. find the news, it's not just about how they manufacture, how they present the news, but it's how they 
filter out what isn't news is even bigger. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, I mean, you know, it's it's the idea of, you know, you've got a story. Here's 100 percent of the story. Right. We're going to take 50 percent of that. Then we're going to carve that down into 30 percent of our narrative. And then you get to look at it. So it's like you're getting, you know, a, a fractured glass perspective of of reality through the news so that you can pick up threads of truth. Um but it's 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 got an agenda. Uh, it's got a narrative, whether it's serving left or right or the military or the corporate, whatever. You know, you can pick up on it quite easily. It's very easy to do in America because literally every single show like ends with like sponsored by Pfizer, or sponsored by <laughs> Pfizer. Like you know, they don't even hide it. They don't even hide who the hell's uh, running their uh, their information. It's wild. That's one thing I struggled with actually going out to the states, bro like is uh just the the level of like there there are so many pharmaceutical adverts on the tv like you know when you're watching tv or something all of the adverts i think like six out of eight commercials in the commercial breaks were like for really intense medical things like really intense medicines that had like a long list of side effects and they have like a happy family celebrating in the sunshine as they just like list all the ways that this thing might wreck you and i was just like wow and they have this just just projected all the time 24 7 it's very interesting like in america specifically as uh, you know as a british guy who doesn't see that and we don't see that in this country it's very weird. Only in America and New Zealand. They're the only two countries. You know that? America and New Zealand are the only two countries that allow uh, the commercials to run on pharmaceuticals. And it's pretty yeah. weird when you get exposed to it. It's very different. It's very weird. I am planning to go to the States this year. So I'll. I'll... Where, are yeah, you, uh, I'll where are you? Where are you thinking of going? Where are you thinking of going? Uh, sort of a Santa Monica area around there. Um, nice. Yeah. So it's. Uh family meetup so looking forward to it but at the same time i'm going to wonder how i'm going to integrate in a society that has a very polarized atmosphere and views that <laughs> sometimes i might how long are you out there for <laughs> it's only a couple of weeks and i'm, I'm sure i'm I'll sure i'm sure you'll be all right you so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> i won't I'm integrate sure. or anything but it'll be, yeah. it'll be it'll be odd you know maybe uh, we'll see Amer Americans are incredibly friendly and and talkative people yeah. is what I've noticed on my experiences in in meeting people in America in different states is that you know they're very warm and they're very welcoming and they're very chatty very talkative which you know the Brit British sometimes get a bit put off by because we're so shy around each other and we're so kind of like oh sorry yes so, okay bye bye yes reserved, quick, quick we, little yeah. sentence like oh how are you doing today oh not too bad and then you you move on. But in America, if I say, how are you doing today? They'll be like, oh, buddy, I've had the craziest day. So basically it started off with, it's like, they'll just talk to you. You know, so you, it's, it's a, I love the cultural differences between uh, the US and, and the UK. It's it's fun. And so I, I end up changing things when I'm out there. Like I start saying sidewalk instead of pavement, or I start <laughs> saying tomato. I honestly yeah, start saying tomato it's because it's, it's just easier to say tomato out there. When you say tomato, they don't understand what you're saying. Well, um keeping uh, with america and certainly at the moment with uh, things going on in the world i wonder if i could ask you a bit more on your views on on trump and i'm sure this is a, another area that is gonna divide uh, divide audience audiences you are, you are you are Thank going you. for the out you're going for like the algorithmic high score of oh, like yes. please <laughs> please <laughs> shadow ban but me, actually please. no i'm gonna ask you first question is actually more around john trump who um was uh I think it was his Donald Trump's uncle worked at MIT. Is this something that shows that Donald Trump has access to information <laughs> that he's not sharing? Or do you think it's all a bit of a, a conspiracy theory, let's say? You'd be good pressed to ask my friend that, Jean Jean Luc. Have you ever have you ever seen uh the chats I've done? They're called the Dream Team chats with Jean Luc and John Majorowski. Ever seen those? I don't believe I have actually. I'm not no sure worries. Well, the, to was be fair, there's one? only a couple of them on my YouTube channel, and and then uh, the the majority of them went onto onto my friend John's channel. But he's a John he's a rings a bell as a name, but I, I can't remember off the top of my head. So have I'm... you heard of the channel Uf UFOs on the level? No, I haven't. No. Okay, well, he, that's his channel. Anyway, um, long story short, he uh, our friend Jean Luc would be a perfect person to ask that question to. And the only reason I say that is because there was a thread he had done on Twitter, which I wish my memory was photographic enough to to quote from because it it was interesting, um, and it involves the. Uh, have you ever heard of? 
is it called the Sonoya or the the Sonoya Aero Club? The Soroya Aero Club? God, I'm messing this up, man. Mm -hmm. I wish I was more prepared for this particular question because <laughs> there is something. Hang on, Sorora. I bet there's a few people yelling at their screens right mm -hmm. now saying what it is. Um I'll try and find it later. But anyway, basically, yeah, there is this there, there's this weird aero club that existed back in shit, I want to say like the 1900s or something. Um, and uh it was a very kind of secretive, elite, exclusive aero club of people, and they a lot of a lot of people believe that they might have been responsible for the whole uh Zeppelin flap, the whole kind of like weird UFO Zeppelin sightings that were seen back in the day. Um, because this is kind of what these people used to, I'm trying to remember the name of it whilst okay, I'm talking, but I don't worry about it. Um, I'll find it later, but it is really interesting. Um, this aero club and on some of the patents on some of the illustrations, there was like Trump, Trump was written all over it. And, um, his, his uncle was an inventor and there was a whole thread of things. I'm really annoyed because I'm not the guest for this question. There is genuine, I know people who would be able to give you really interesting answers to this question because okay. I don't know enough about it. It was just a cursory thing that I'm aware of, but I will answer in general terms. I would say it's probably not that likely that he knows anything that's like truly disruptive and the reason i say that is because looking at trump's personality like looking at the kind of person he is kind of feel like he would have used that as bragging rights before then um and maybe even maintained that as a talking point now which he hasn't done he was like as ufos were popular if you if you remember this was at the height of like ufos being reported in the news during the trump administration and he was asked questions he's an egotistical guy so yeah he's probably going to inflate his own level of knowledge and say oh i've been told a few things about roswell let me tell you something oh they're definitely hiding something and hell he's probably right um but i don't know if i i kind of feel like if he actually had something that he knew like he knows that there's like a deep state that has anti-gravity or something man he would if he had if he wouldn't have said it he would have hinted way more than he has mm -hmm. uh because his ego could not hold that in his ego could not hold in something that big i just i just feel so um yeah i don't i i think it was probably just hype hyperbole it was probably just over inflation in all honesty okay. and um and more um turning more to recent uh developments what what do you think's going on with this whole um arrest do, um, i i see it as a bit as a witch hunt do you do you agree on that the, the whole kind of yeah thing? i mean like look at the end of the day and people want to call me all sorts of things on twitter <laughs> not a lot of people mind you but a few people would like to really consider me as some sort of alt-right pro putin trump supporter which i'm not any of those things um I think that it was very clear that he did not represent the establishment because the establishment made a concerted effort to just completely, you know, put him under a magnifying glass. And so for me, it's not about political allegiance because, well, for one, I'm British. So, it, it you know, although yeah. America has a big impact on us as a major, you know, one of our oldest and most trusted partners, part of the Five Eyes, certainly an important geopolitical giant to pay attention to who will influence our own decision making so it's definitely okay to have opinions on american politics as a british as a british citizen um what i would say is that it's the clear hypocrisy that does my head in it's just the hypocrisy trump's a douchebag he's a he's a billionaire you know selfish egotistical douchebag and he's probably done loads of things that are criminal cool so is Hillary Clinton. So is Bush. I think so that's Obama. where um, I find it um, difficult to accept a lot of the accusations pointed at Trump when, firstly, we were aware of the, the criminality suggested that's going on behind the scenes with the Bushes, the Clintons, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not like they're all, you know, <laughs> they've got no skeletons in their closet but well, it's I mean, also I... the fact that people said that trump when he came in all this bad stuff would happen 
But the reality was, and this is just from, from a neutral perspective, there wasn't a, a war during his time there. Because he's such a loose cannon. He might he even said that he would nuke Beijing. You know, who knows if the dude's joking? He said he would mm. nuke Beijing. You, you don't think Xi Jinping was sitting there going, well, well, he might. He might. I don't know. This guy's kind of crazy. But with Joe Biden, it's just like roll right through. Roll right through. Mm. And, uh, you know, I I just think that we need a, a drastic reshuffle of, pol of, of political leadership in, in the West, in, in our country as well, mate. I mean, let, you know, let's not throw too much uh you know cold water on our on our colonial brothers and sisters when we have rishi sunak the stooge of the global world economic forum uh who is running our country who wants nothing more than to stop everyone from the countries we're destroying from coming here and and, and you know seeking some sort of assistance and also wants to prevent any of us from having any sort of meaningful amount of money and uh, wants to hmm. control that through digital currency. So yeah, I mean, like we're we're all in a bad state. We're all in a bad state. You know, yeah. you've got a you know got a geriatric president in America. You've got a globalist, money hungry sociopath in uh, in England. You've got um, is Emmanuel Macron still in France or is he buggered off now? No, I think he's still there. And he's still there. Writing. <laughs> Emmanuel Macron, World Economic Forum, Young Global Leadership Program, yeah, again, yeah, you know, yeah. um, Justin Trudeau, Young Global Leadership Program, World Economic Forum, Jacinda Ardern, New Zealand, Young Global Leadership Program, World Economic Forum, Boris Johnson, Young Global Leadership Program, like, you know, do I have to keep repeating the pattern or can we just say that these people are all part of an agenda that's go? it's not about countries, it's about a structure of beyond countries you know that's the the danger like, real quick and I, I know i'm kind of talking a lot but i just have so many thoughts on this is that you have like klaus schwab from the world economic forum is in the chairman ceo chairman of the world economic forum who literally said you know this was a, like a year ago when he was like oh a year ago i was visiting trudeau in canada and you know i know that when i go into his cabinet half or uh, or more than half are for our world economic forum you know and he said it in his you know scary bond villain german accent where it's just like oh yes i went and they yeah, we yeah. he's like we that, penetrated yeah. the cabinets he literally said we've we have penetrated mm. the cabinets you know yeah. they've penetrated the cabinets penetrated well, going back to what you said earlier it's, it's all hidden in plain sight isn't it hidden in plain sight man <laughs> hidden in plain sight you know why 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 is Joe Biden and Boris Johnson and Justin Trudeau and Emmanuel Macron and Jacinda Ardern all saying build back better, build back better. Oh, yeah. did, did they all just like decide that was a fun slogan. Like, no, they're all part of the same chanting, the same group, the same cult, the same movement, same agenda. And they want to present themselves as little pockets of influence in different countries. But really, they're just nodes. They are nodes on a network that leads towards what? A global autocracy world economic forum that's what it is it's the dystopian nightmare that no one wants to see happen where you have you know global corp the thing that runs the whole world like in some sci-fi blade runner-esque uh kind of scenario where you have you know globo corp or that's the world economic forum if we, if that's allowed to succeed that's what it becomes it becomes the global corporate government and everyone's existing on like credits and uh you know it's it's a bit of a a bit of a shitty thing to live in so i don't really want to live in that no um no. if that does happen rest assured i will be a, a part of some scruffy ra ragtag rebellion trying to run around well, solving problems it, when um i mean now now that i've uh in, got more involved with the ufo topic i now watch um star wars and uh and see it as a form of I guess just describing the choice point that we have right now as we look yeah. look to our future. Do we want to be a world owned by what <laughs> we would consider, if we look at the movie, as being the empire in terms of, you know, the highly structured, highly formulated system where we're all part of one machine? Or do we want to be like in uh, Tatooine or whatever, the, the part of the rebellion that just kind of just live life as as, as peacefully as possible. But I'm, I'm, ta I'm tattooing starfighters and shoot off a couple of uh, of empire people. I mean, I'm, ta I'm tattooing all the way, baby. Tattooing yeah, I mean, me too. But I think I think it's it's um, if people want to kind of try and understand what this choice point is about that we're kind of entering in, I feel like it's a good way of describing what what world would you rather live in, <laughs> you know? And I think most people yeah. would rather live in the Tatooine world. 
but they don't realize yeah. that they're probably supporting the the empire maybe unintentionally you know in a way you, so. you know i do have uh, like i do have optimism for anyone listening i am actually genuinely optimistic <laughs> about the future um because i i kind of just think you know the moment the moments in my own life where it just like oh no nothing's ever going to be good again i was always wrong and like you know or like <laughs> worrying about something and creating a situation in my head the situation's yeah. always worse than the actual event that yeah. unfolds like in real life exam or something like, so, yeah. yeah yeah so like we always exaggerate too much in our own mind and so like yeah when you look at global authorities and ai and surveillance and data it's like oh my god nothing's gonna be good again but that's not true. That's not true. It's like there are going to be tough times. It's just like anyone's life. It's just like an individual mm -hmm. life. You don't want to go through life without a single tough time. If that happens, one, it's a miracle. It should never happen. And two, you're going to be a boring person. You're going to be a boring, unwise, per under underdeveloped person. You need to go through struggle. It's just part of life. Well, uh, that, that leads me on to some very pertinent questions about I guess the nature of reality and of consciousness, which is a very um, something that I'm also very interested in. Um, actually, before I turn on to that, you said right at the beginning about uh, your interest in, I think it was in quantum mechanical structure and consciousness. And I think for me, uh, looking back, before I kind of got into understanding the UFO cover up and the false narratives and everything, before that, I was really interested in understanding the the quantum nature of reality and the um uh, people like Matt, michael talbot who, who did a really mm -hmm. good book and the the theories i think there's uh gerald de huft and hawking talked about how they saw the universe as a 3d projection on a 2d surface and they could show through physics and the black holes how that how that was possible based on the information and understanding hawking radiation i think it was but this went on to me and, and someone who did, you know, I did physics um, and astronomy at university. So I'm very sort of scientific and I, I was really interested in cosmology and, and the big bang, which, you know, um, is all, all very interesting. And I guess at that time I was trying to think maybe, maybe nature is, is it a simulation? Is it a hologram? And since then I've come to the belief in my mind, I see the universe is consciousness is primary and the material world is secondary built on that. So what wonder what your what your thoughts are around that? Well, you know what's funny is uh I have so many thoughts on that. So I'm I'm <laughs> I'm gonna try not to go on a tirade, but um you know what's funny about that, man, is that we actually have a saying that we just just throw out there as if we don't really think about it. And what is that saying? When when you need to do something and you're not doing it, mate. What am I going to say to you? I'll say, hey, listen, man, it's mind over matter. Yeah. Mind over matter because mind is over matter. And we have literally forgotten how powerful of a statement that is. No, that we, no, just, so we, just, we just use it. Mind is over matter. It sits above it. It is the dominant part of the, of the hierarchy of the universe. And I truly believe that. And I think that quantum mechanics and simulation theory you know it's 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 just a very analytical approach to what is in my opinion an esoteric question but it is an analytical question you know what's at the foundation of reality what's at the foundation of the process um you know what we understand as reality is so fragmentary it's so incomplete um but we present this overwhelming sense of hubris as if we figured it out we figured out the basics at least yeah. we figured out this the kind of like this uh, th this template we're on a level playing field and now we're just trying to understand the more exotic ideas but this in my opinion this is not true there there are no foundations upon which science is built ultimately because ultimately there's only one foundation upon which the rest of the architecture is constructed so whether you're a quantum physicist or a biochemist or anything else what truly lies at the foundation of all of this is how did any of this start to begin with? And this is the big glitch. This is the big glitch in the assumption that we have a sturdy foundation upon which this towering edifice of science has been constructed. We don't have a clue how the universe began. No evidence, no data to provide that would solidify it. 
into a conclusion or an explanation. So the truth is that we're studying the effects of the creation of time and space, but we're not studying the cause of time and space. The cause is beyond our ability to perceive. And my suggestion, at least this is how I see it, is that whilst this insight remains kind of obscured by the rudimentary tools of science when faced with the grandest mystery what lies at the bedrock of creation what lies at the at the foundation of the process consciousness and specifically perturbed or altered states of consciousness seem to offer up data something that can assist in this process of understanding how all of this started and what it really means and the desire to refine my own understanding of consciousness has continued to be a source of inspiration for me in the in the ufo research field as well but this is the problem this is the problem for me is that we don't know the begin. we can't describe the beginnings we don't know how it all started and so consciousness is this untapped aspect and it's a very general thing to say that consciousness you know because we don't really what is consciousness but just the hidden corridors of expanded mind and the, the weird things that people can experience and see in different types of orientations of consciousness this we we don't explore this enough we're starting to yeah. with psychedelics you know the psychedelic studies and we're starting to kind of go down these novel routes of like you know oh what happens when we perturb it like this oh okay okay well you know let's figure out why these deities are saying things to us in these states but this is for the most part a really unexplored avenue of science in the kind of like post age of enlightenment you know we had a very esoteric science before the age of enlightenment newtonian reductionism kind of set in as the as the uh, the the uh, the foundational basics for for physics and and for applying the scientific method before then you had very esoteric scientists and before then you had shamans and i think what's needed now and i kind of feel and this is where i'll shut up in a second because i told you i'll just keep <laughs> talking I'll, i will just keep talking but i want to just finish this thought off is that what i think is that we've gone from the shamanistic to the technical <clears throat> to the techno shamanistic i think that's where we might be going the techno shamanistic where you have this meeting in the middle between esoteric and scientific between intuition and logic between analytics and whatever you want to call it the physics and metaphysics spirit and science i think that these things are kind of coming to this meeting point and who knows maybe agi and this whole singularity i mean my god man mikai morin blowing my brain the other day on the interview i had with him recently for like two and a half hours just telling me about how ai is going to change everything and like you know maybe i don't know maybe there's like some weird post singularity event uh, or you know the we're moving towards and after that it's like spirit and science are mixed together <clears throat> but a little a little bit like how we can't envision the beginning of time and space i feel like it's almost impossible to envision what happens in the near future because i feel like something's coming man like i can't fully explain it i well, felt like, it since since like 2020 like mm -hmm. about 2020 i was like you know what this decade man there's something about it in my gut do i need to get a bug out bag do i need to buy tins of beans do i need to invest in <laughs> cryptocurrency do i need to buy gold something needs i know i need to be preparing but i don't know what for something's yeah. happening and found out i'm not alone in that my god so many people feel the same and then you have you know, people like Mikai who come on and say my literal data, my analytics, my projections, because that dude's just like a savant. He's just analytics, analytics, data, data. Yeah. And he's like, my projections say we're coming towards a singularity in less than 10 years. And then it's just like, oh, my God, man. Like, you know, was my intuition correct? Are we coming towards something radical that's going to change everything? And maybe after that, we will understand consciousness a bit better. Or it'll be Blade Runner. I don't know, man. Like, <laughs> it's really hard to tell what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, I think I gave you gave you a lot there. I'm sorry, I gave you a hell of a no, lot. No, no, it's 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 interesting. I, I um, there's two ways of looking at that, and one is very positive, and one's very negative. I guess the very positive view is that we're we're all going to come out of this, and we're all going to kind of grow spiritually, and I guess technically as well, and be able to start to voyage amongst the stars and become um, one of many different civilizations out there. And the other one is that we just have a, there's a reset, I guess, <laughs> but yeah. um, we, we I, I can't, I don't know if I, if I can prep as well for what's coming 
for the future. As we say, we don't know. Don't know what to prep for. Yeah, don't I know don't what to prep, prep for. for. But also, I think if you if you are a prepper, you're drawing a target on your back when things go south. <laughs> <laughs> you are drawing a target on your back but you have more things to fire back at other targets with so you know it's yeah. uh it, we're on. a little bit we're a bit screwed in the uk really because if the apocalypse happens i mean it will be back we'll be back to sword fighting mate there's no guns everyone it will just be yeah like, well i'm trying to grow plants and stuff but we just don't have the climate as you say we're talking about the weather again but no, uh, it's difficult no. we're not we're not quite available i don't think we could do yeah i uh... might i might move to a warmer climate for the apocalypse <laughs> yeah. i might you know before before the whole apocalypse kicks in i might head over to like you know california or something or yeah no i mean like you know there's there's some i know some people who prep bro i know i know some people out there in america i've got some friends who have prepped like they've got vaults of weapons and like you know my god, god everything under the sun it's like they've got the kind of house where if you were in like a survival game and you found it it'd be like the best house like oh my god it's got all the treasure and all the loot weapons and drinks and resources yeah i'm i'm not prepared at all like i said i i genuinely had this feeling at the beginning of 2020 that like this this decade was going to be important um but i just didn't know for what reason so like i think i've settled on i'm just gonna keep trying to raise some level of awareness to the fact yeah. that this is all happening you know and like i've been lucky as, as it might be i'm i'm trying to up the vibe as the podcast is i feel like vibe. well yeah. exactly man like you know we talk about we've talked about some heavy stuff but i, I think ultimately up the vibe but uh... it's, no no but i think ultimately upping the vibe isn't going to necessarily always mean telling people something they will really enjoy hearing it's more about kind of raising that awareness so that people become more conscious as as human beings and become you know a little bit more uh open to a wider aspect of reality and that does involve uncomfortable truths about you know global yeah. power and all this kind of stuff but it also involves really expansive ideas about consciousness and the implications of reality and life in the universe and you know the ufo subject really does uh fascinate me and i find it also very you know frustrating it's kind of like a, a love-hate relationship with that thing but i have seen stuff and i wouldn't say like i said earlier on in the talk i wouldn't say it's alien like in the typical sense i wouldn't know maybe it is but i i wouldn't say to you oh yeah no that that was the palladian star brothers and star yeah. sisters like i don't i don't i Maybe some people have been told that, but I haven't been told that. So I'm not going to say that shit because it's not what I know. All I know 100% is that there are things out there that respond to signals in the human conscious mind. And I don't know what they are, but they responded to very high energy, loving, positive emotion. That's what I was grounding my state in. And, you know, I think the hippies really have had it right the whole time about love and peace man like you know i don't know why that's such a weird thing for us why is it so normal to see violence on tv but having sex in the street would be a nightmare we're a very strange human species you know we, we have this twisted perspective on what's acceptable violence fine love ugh, cringy unsuitable uncouth you know whatever especially in britain you know we're a very sexually repressed uh country <laughs> britain into we, we, we do it to ourselves we're just very shy and like you know kind of it's weird man i'm not i think i've got more of the european blood in me in that, in that aspect but <laughs> seriously though it's not a normal thing to do i don't really know why we do that i know that i don't know i don't know i'm kind of like on yeah, a there's, 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 a lot, there's a lot of odd, odd things going on there and, and you were you said about the palladians and um yeah no that I was guess, it I, I yeah. met, some somehow i went from palladian star sisters to why we should all be having sex in the street and uh, yeah i know it was a, little, uh, it's a bit of mental gymnastics i'm sure that says something but, about me in uh, terms <laughs> of um the palladians um so when i hear like people like grant cameron they talk um in ways that make me feel like the phenomenon has changed in line with our own understanding it was it was um people from mars and then it became people from yeah. um you know further away in Pleiades or now they're different they're coming from different dimensions or different time so the where will they come from to... next <laughs> where they're coming from next but from that perspective you could say well then maybe none of it is kind of like concrete truth but it's all kind of changing in line with our own um yeah. oh, but then also I listen to some people like channelers contactees and one in particular I've had on her uh, twice, Elena Denard. She's been really good. And she has 
supposedly a contact and i i do believe that she has a contact that in the um that's out there that's that tells me that there are intelligent beings in spaceships orbiting earth and it's kind of crazy to think that that's happening but um what, what's your thoughts around that do you think do you think there's there's some truth um to what yeah. these contactees are saying about what's going on out there the annoying the annoying thing about channeling is i think it's i think it's 100 percent real and i think that 90 percent of people are liars that's the issue with it <laughs> okay. is that i think that not necessarily liars maybe that's a bit too aggressive um misinformed I think truly, there's a lot of opportunity for truly wanting to believe something when it might not necessarily be what you're what you're believing i think that channeling is real i just think that there's a lot of hucksters and hoaxers and people that pretend to be stuff and that's what ruins it for everyone it's the same as ce5 i mean the the idea that i have managed to coax orange orbs to turning up over my house because of my mind is is a ridiculous thing to say and it is something that most people outside of these research fields uh would would say is just not not even worth believing could be possible so uh, you know i have to acknowledge that i myself i'm a, i'm in a position very similar to the channelers no no evidence something incredible happened with my consciousness and it was proof of another intelligence. It's all the same stuff as channeling. Uh, the only difference is mine was visual, not linguistic, right? I had a visual experience, not a, lingu a linguistic experience or, or an inspirational experience. But um, I'll tell you something, mate. Um, when I'm playing this thing over here and, you know, getting into a into a real flow with it, there, there gets a point where I'm not thinking at all. Like not thinking where the fingers are going or what the chord's going to be. It's just yeah, happening. I'm just state, in like yeah. some automatic flow state. I would call yeah. that channeling. And yeah, yeah. You know, Nikola Tesla, Nikola Tesla, he was channeling. He was channeling information and he knew it. Uh, the only difference is where are you channeling it from? Is it the Arcturians and the Galactic Council and the Palladians or is it from what we would call God? Is it the Akashic records, the universal well, index sort of higher consciousness in a way as well? Your higher, your higher consciousness. So I think that there is a channeling. I just don't know if we understand what the actual channeler is to us. I, I think maybe we we misinterpret it or our bias kicks in and we give it a template and we dress it up. But I think that it could just be the universe. I think it's the, you know, the universe is like a bubbling cauldron of information. It's just information or like, you know, data. Some physicists would say that it's just made of information. Everything's made of just inherently information, uh, energy encoded with information, right? Mm -hmm. So if that's true, I would look at us as kind of like refined receptors. So you're constantly receiving information. So I think that when you're in a certain state, you just open up the funnel a bit more. You get a bit more in. And so very intuitive people. It's definitely, it's not exclusive, but it definitely seems to be something you can see very clearly with um, kind of like high functioning emotional intelligence and intuitive intelligence, not so much analytical intelligence. Analytical intelligence is very, very important, but it grounds you into this reality and it makes you observe the four walls around you and that's basically what you have what i see is what i am what i see is what i what is in front of me but emotional intelligence or intuitive intelligence is that other one right it's the abstract thinker it's the one that goes all oh, but the walls are actually made of vibrating energy and if i vibrated at the same energy as the wall or maybe slightly faster i could pass through it because it's not actually real and nothing's actually real and do I even know I'm real? Because when I dream, I think I'm in a real place. You know, that's abstract thought. That's like that. That's that kind of like intuitive abstract thought. And I think that that seems to lend credence towards having experiences with anomalous phenomena, having contact situations, and being more open to this kind of information, because you have the ability to look beyond what has been kind of told to you as normal. And very analytically minded people, not all the time, because Mackay, again, my friend, good friend of mine, and uh, you know, I've had him on a couple times. I've said this about uh, him: is that we're like almost two different parts of that. We're like two hemispheres. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of like more the creative, uh, emotional intelligence, and he's more the analytical intelligence. So it's very interesting when we have conversations because he's going, 
everything is a simulation. I think it's like an AI simulation. I'm going, everything is a spiritual simulation. I think it's a spiritual simulation. And so we're both kind of of the exact same opinion, but coming from different observational points, he's all analytics. So he looks at the basic physics of the universe and goes, it's a uni it's a universe of information. It's a simulation. I look at my life and I look at all the weird things that have happened in it and all the kind of coincidences and synchronicities. And I go, the universe is talking to me. The universe is intelligent. There's a there's a consciousness embedded within this. So we're both kind of like same perspective, but different observations. And I find that very interesting when it comes to channeling. And and like just to get us back onto what we were just talking about, is that emotional intelligence and very creative people, artists, and uh, you know um, inventors, they seem to have a more open funnel for yeah. some of this information. And I'll end it with just this quote from Nikola Tesla, where he says, and it's, you know, it's one of my favorite quotes where he says, my brain is only a receiver in the universe. There is a core from which we gain knowledge, strength, and inspiration. I have not found the location of this core, but I know that it exists. And that to me has always struck me as powerful because what he's saying as a scientist is this is science. I'm doing science. But I know that this inspiration for this science, it's coming from something. I can't explain it. It's powerful. It's bigger than I can comprehend. I don't know where it is. I can't figure out that bloody coordinates for this thing, but I know it exists. I know it's real. That's faith. That's faith in the underlying spirit of reality. And Nikola Tesla is a brilliant scientist. Nobody should debate that. So you can be a brilliant scientist and still have a faith in the spirit of reality and recognize that no matter what you're doing, there's a spirit that's informing and helping and intuitively driving it. And that they, these things don't have to be at odds with each other, science and spirit. They don't. You know, you can be doing science in a spiritual realm. You know, and uh, I think inherently we are in a spiritual realm. I don't really know what spiritual means, but I guess I just mean like it's not an, it's not a computer simulation. I think it's a, a think, conscious um, energy. For me, it's uh, a case of is the universe sort of a, a series of random events that we somehow are part of and we're just observing, or are we creating it for, is, it, is there a purpose? And I think right now it's hard to say, what the purpose is because i can't remember what happened before i was born and yeah. um i don't know what will happen when i die but i do believe i have faith that there is more to just this short period on this planet and for that reason i think there is purpose and there is i hope, I hope you're right growth i hope you're right i agree i hope you're right i mean <laughs> i mean like do you, do you i'm sure you do mate because you seem like it do you ever just wake up or do you ever just you know just walking down the street and you're just like what is being alive like what is this like why am i even i sometimes have it will yeah. stop me in my in my stride and i'll just be like uh, actually a, a why am i story. observing anything i, I like, used to say and this was actually going back to when i was probably a teenager um i, I used to say to myself <clears throat> i am me i am me i would say it I, I would, almost like the seventh or eighth time suddenly you have this almost infinitesimally small moment where this kind of like realization of what that actually meant happened. And it was, it was so small, but it was enough yeah. for me to go, wow. <laughs> in, in that kind of, and, it, and I think that spurred a lot of my maybe spiritual growth mm -hmm. from an early age in sense of understanding that um, just being an individual, it's not just about that I exist um, on this planet. It's about no, having an existence, just the, existence, just having an existence. And what is because, that about? I mean, yeah, well, I mean, like you said, we don't remember crazy. where we, we don't remember where we were before. So this is like, you know, I, I believe we probably came from somewhere, but for all respects and purposes, like this is the first time you've been a conscious being mate. Like this is the yeah. first time me and you have been like a thing that's conscious, like just we're at, where was our awareness before it was here, you know? And like, that has always been something, I think even from a young age, that's genuinely just niggled at my, at the back of my mind, like, you know, wh where was this thing that's experiencing this now? Where, where was it after, before this? And and I I just feel like my life in, and I'm, I'm only 20, I forgot my age, I'm only 28, I'm only 28 years old, not even that old. Um, 
I already feel like I've had so much like nudging me going like, yeah, there's so much more. Like there's so, so much more than just this little, little slice that you're occupying right now. You're here for whatever reason, but this isn't it. This isn't it. Like this yeah, is, uh, and that, and that's where I guess my thoughts on the craziness of the world turns away from, Oh my goodness, what's happening to this is a gift. <laughs> this is a gift to be here and experience it. Yeah. Just yeah. see and see it all unfold. It's it to be especially and, at this and time I, is is actually a good gift. Yeah, it is a gift, and I and I and I'm I'm honestly not trying to download any sort of uh, uh, white privilege guilt onto us, but it's also a gift to be uh, you know in a privileged position, which we are. Even just being Westerners living in houses, you know, we're in a podcast doing podcasts. You know, we're in a very privileged position to be able to speak to people and share ideas and have freedom in our time and, and not have to worry about, you know, um, literal day-to-day -day survival, like literal day-to-day -day survival, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so like, yeah, I think, I don't, I don't think it's, oh God, it's such an unpopular thing to say. Cause if I say this, people will be like, I, I mean, I, I've, I've said it before and I think it's true. Um, that I, I don't think that, we suffer through a lack of choice. Like I think that our spirit understands why it's here. It wants to be here for a certain set of reasons. And if that reason is to live for one year and then go, that's, that's it. That's it what it wants. It's a very but... controversial thing, but I just, I just feel like we can't understand the agenda of the soul. We, we, you can understand the agenda of the human, you know, me as a, as a human being, but me as a human being, I don't, think my desires are essentially the same as my soul's desires i might because dude there's been plenty of things i've wanted in life that have kind of like been taken away from me and i've been like oh my god and then it led to a healing process or it was like a necessary thing so yeah. my it's almost like the soul the soul has like a long game the soul's got this long game process of where it wants to go and you're the you're the ego the brain you're also the soul obviously you're that's that's you but you're also the brain the human the ego and so like there's like this battle between what the human wants what the soul wants and i think that's where people get it mixed up is like obviously all of us want to live forever but hey maybe my soul wants me to go tomorrow mate i, I don't know i well, don't know you know i, I think, don't I think have when any... you really think about the fact that you exist and there's a potential that that you exist might never not exist there's a, there's a both a liberation and a scary aspect to that an infiniteness <laughs> you're telling me you're telling me I think, that, you know, I think it fuels a lot of the fears inherent in society is i think um not consciously but just subconsciously in the back of the mind of like the collective is this dread like we're just this little ball floating through fucking infinity man like there's <laughs> no one else out there like you know maybe maybe that's and i i said this i tweeted this not that long ago just a little thought but i was just like you know it's not about them being our gods but maybe we just need another species to be like hey like you're not alone it's you, you know we're all out here like i don't know like maybe something so beautifully simple is what we actually need like a crying child lost alone and has no adults near it and it just doesn't know what to do and suddenly be, you know yeah. the adult steps in and picks up the child and the child's like oh okay you know everything's better again maybe we're just a scared kid in the corner of space man like we're just this young well, little think, species what... When, when you believe that your entire existence amounts to uh, what maybe 70 years of which, you know, 30 years might be in retirement in a home and 30 years, you know, you're just struggling to get onto the onto the ladder and you just feel like where where is the opportunity for anything else? But if that's your belief in existence, then, yeah, I guess it's it's hard to uh, come up, come across at the nature of reality uh, in a positive way. But if you would start to step, take a step back and think of yourself as a soul in this infinite realm, and it's chosen to be here for spiritual growth, and you understand the reason why there is this sort of interplay of dark and light, of positive yep. and negative, of a whole, whole multitude of perspectives all around you, it just... It gives you that flavor 
um, flavor is not the right word, but a, a kind of a, an ability to view the world in a way that gives you some relief that you, you and there's a conscious belief that you are you're having this gift and experience to grow and it's not all doom and gloom. Yeah, it kind well, of I, changes the perspective, I guess. I'm yeah, and I think that, um, and uh, by the way, this has been a really fascinating conversation. We might have to cut it off soon just because oh, it's um, getting a little late. I'm, I'm really enjoying it, though, just just to let you know, having a great time. No, no, um, um, I, I but literally coming up to the point where I, I, I was hoping to talk to you about the geezer and the Sphinx because I have had a, f a few conversations around that recently. Yeah, about let, me, and, let me just let me just maybe maybe that we can save that for another day and just maybe... no, no, I'm happy to happy, happy to do that now. I just really want to finish okay. my thought before I forget it, man, yeah. um, because, you know, talking about kind of like dark light and just before we get off onto the onto the uh, Egypt thing, um, you know, if we if we do come from like a sublime realm where it's like, you know, just light, <laughs> then it makes sense that this realm is light and dark. It's the place we go to experience the opposite to understand what we are. You know, if you exist in the sublime state of sublimeness in the sublime reality, then all you know is being sublime, right? Like, <laughs> oh, I'm the light in the light of the light dimension. All I am is the light. I am the light and that's what I am. Yeah. So you come here as a little light in the dark to understand you're a light, to experience being a light, to experience being, and I'm gonna use controversial terms just because they're good terms to use for this particular thing is experience being God. You are literally instead instead of knowing instead of just knowing you are like oh i know i am the light now you get to experience the actual process of becoming the light through navigating through the dark right <laughs> and i think that this is where you have the allegories of you know i i will not fear as i walk through the valley of death and all this kind of stuff is is it's it's knowing you are the powerful light and yeah, you are surrounded in darkness, brother. It's a dark world, but you're the light. That's what you are. And that's what you're here to remember. And I think that's part of it. You know, I do think that's part of it. I think the spiritual people have got it right. I don't think we, I don't think anyone's got it completely right, but I think that's part of it. 100%. Mm -hmm. Come on, let's talk about Egypt before I go to bed. <laughs> um well, I, I guess uh, I've had um, people, I don't know if you've heard of um, Gary Osborne, um, who, who wrote, co-wrote with Jim Penniston about uh, the um, the Wrench and, and Wrench and Enigma. But he took on um, the role, uh, I guess, of and just trying to understand the code that Jim Penniston said he received when, after he touched the this unknown craft. And um, this was in the evening. So there's a, there's a story, backstory behind this, but... Um, this code, well, it's in binary, and it actually gives a set of coordinates. And um, Gary Osborne uh, has shown that potentially, in his view, this actually shows a link to the fine structure constant, thus proving that it's from, you know, um, maybe it's a future human or it's advanced intelligence, but they're kind of like sort of stamping their intelligence on the message. Well, didn't it say we are you? Didn't he get the, didn't he get the like telepathic communication when he said, what are you? And they said, we are you or something like that. Something um, like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Although I, he hasn't really, I couldn't really pin Jim Penniston down. I interviewed him on what his belief this thing was. He, he didn't, didn't go down the ET route anyway, Yeah. but um, he had an experience. And from that um, develops, what was potentially um, a, a discovery about uh, uh, connections with Giza and the fine structure constant. And, and I won't dwell on that too much, but so I'm talking to Rob Leland soon, who's someone who's worked with Robert Schock. And I talked to a guy called Manu Sesfade. Anyway, they all believe, or they've all been part of this, um, I guess, old history narrative on, on Egypt, on the Sphinx and who built the pyramids and on all this, which I'm very, much part of since reading like Graham Hancock and people and uh, people like that. So, what 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 do you think's going on? Um, I guess is the question uh, uh, under the Sphinx. Is there a hall of records? Is there more to be discovered? Yes, there is a. No, I'm not. I'm, I was gonna just. I was gonna go <laughs> off on some uh, on some Gaia esque diatribe of how I know everything about what's underneath the Sphinx. But um, no, I don't know. But I think that Egypt is profoundly powerful i think that there is the a real 
I mean, ancient Egypt, you know, um, the pyramids, I think being there is a, a whole other thing, whole other thing, you know, um, I was very fortunate to be able to go out to Egypt and, uh, and to go into the great pyramid of Giza, uh, without any public, we, you know, we had yeah, the, we had yeah, the, yeah. had the Giza plateau shut down, um, and we had full access and yeah, it's when you're in those things, man, I'm not going to sit there and go like, oh, you know, I felt this incredible, like, but seriously, when you just like, you look at these things and you put your hands on them, you're like, oh, you're, a, you're a profoundly powerful structure, aren't you? And, um, you know, you go into these things and there's no, there's no hieroglyphs. There's no artwork. It's all just very precise engineering. This thing. Did you get a is... different energy inside? Did you have a different energy about the area? Oh. I did in the King's Chamber. Um, yeah, but that, I mean, I was that was part of a whole ceremonial initiation type of deal, and that was certainly I think that played a part in me feeling a different energy. Was that I was being kind of like there was a whole environment around it, which probably made it even more uh, pronounced. But I had one incredible, well, actually two. <laughs> actually three but one of them involved hash so we'll leave that one out <laughs> um <laughs> three incredible experiences in egypt now two two incredible experiences one which was yes uh, sleep deprived and hash induced which to be fair are both shamanistic techniques because mm. sleep deprivation is a shamanistic technique and obviously the use of hashish is also a shamanistic thing and i did have a very interesting experience like 3 a.m on a boat looking out over a temple site on a mountaintop as the prayers in arabic were echoing through the megaphones of the city <laughs> and i was sleep deprived and a little bit high and uh, definitely had a profoundly strong experience of being like pulled towards this temple and and the prayers echoing and that was amazing but that was just you know that, that that's not on the same kind of level as these other things that happened to me um but i we were in i want to say dendara temple the temple to hathor uh, i think it was that temple and um there was a statue and this is this is the thing right this this got me this got me um because there were a couple of people who were always saying at every site oh i'm getting this profound feeling oh i'm getting it you know and i was I, I i'm like this really weird spiritual guy i'm like very skeptical of people sometimes so i'm kind of like there rolling my eyes like yeah of course you're feeling the energy of egypt you know like ooh. But dude, I felt something in one place, um, and it was this statue of oh, I've forgotten the name. Um, I can't, uh, uh, okay, I can't remember the name. I'm sorry, but it was a statue of this goddess, and it was in an area in this temple which people didn't normally go to. It was behind these big wooden doors, and they were closed. And I think our our guide Muhammad Ibrahim, who's a fantastic guide, by the way. So he uh, he he basically said to us after the fact, oh, you know, I wasn't even going to show you that. I was, we were we were not even going to do that. He went up to the guard and he you know spoke in Arabic and he, he he greased the wheels and got the doors open for us basically, and we all got to go into this little room. And what's really interesting about the room, right, is that you got these big wooden doors. And then you open it up and there's like a stone wall in front of you and there's like a, a turning to go this way. So you kind of actually go in and then turn right to, to go down this narrow passageway, which then opens up into a small room with sand on the floor. It's completely dark, apart from one hole in the roof where the light is coming. I mean, it's so Indiana Jones, like this, the light is coming down from one point, lighting up this statue at the back of the room, this big statue. And I had been filming everything. I've been filming absolutely everything. I've been walking around like this through every site we've gone to, just filming the whole thing because I wanted to document loads of it for the YouTube channel and I wanted to put loads of stuff out. So I was walking into this room like this, ready to turn around the corner and capture this statue. I come around the corner. I see the statue on the camera. Then I look at it with my eyes and then my camera just, then my arm just falls down to my side and i just stare at this statue and get locked into it like some weird gravity well it was it was very strange i i 
I was I just started staring and I could feel like I could feel like the intensity of something staring right back at me, man. Like, like, and everyone in the room felt the same thing. It was so weird. When everyone came out, they were like, what's going on? I felt like that thing was just like staring into my soul. And I was like, yeah, I felt the exact same thing. And I, this was the first time I felt like anything in Egypt. I kind of gone out there hoping, oh, maybe I'll get some weird flashback or something. You know, nothing happened. But that happened when I went into that room and stared at that statue. It's there is a resonance to that thing. I don't know if it's what it's made out of. I don't know if they imbued it with some conscious intention when they created it, or if it's like an ET artifact. I don't know. But it's put it's putting off an energy. It is a hundred percent. There is a there is an energy. At least you know I. As someone who was not experiencing that kind of thing out there, it was like, bam, and I just like couldn't stop. So yeah, that's an interesting one. And we also did see some weird flashing lights in the sky, like UFOs, at a really coincidental moment in the trip when we were on the on the tour bus coming out of the Saqqara Desert, um, just leaving the Red Pyramid and the Bent Pyramid, and Timothy Hogan, the Grand Master of the Knights Templar, was reading a piece of Egyptian script about this saucer, this flight, this fiery disc that was coming over um, pre-dynastic e Egypt uh, from these official kind of like you know scrolls that he'd uh, he'd come across, and uh, and then suddenly we started seeing these flashing white lights in the crystal clear blue sky of the Saqqara Desert. One flash, two flash, three flash, four flash. So yeah, we we saw that, which multiple people on the bus saw, and it's very hard to uh, say what that was. Uh, certainly not anything conventional. But Egypt, just to summarize and, and conclude, Egypt has a profound history, spiritually, esoterically, alchemically, yeah. uh, scientifically, mathematically, yeah, yeah. Um, engineering wise, and I think that if anything, if anything. The pyramids, the Great Pyramids, are meant to be a time capsule through history that has information encoded into it. It has information about, I think, pretty incredible cosmic concepts and laws encoded into the engineering of the very building itself. It's a message. The actual structures are a message and we haven't fully decoded that message yet they may have other applications but at the very least it's some form of message through time from some builders that i don't think we really understand certainly not thousands of uneducated slave labors certainly not that certainly not big ramps i'm not saying aliens but just certainly not the way we conventionally think yeah. the pyramids were built it's it's got some other it's got a special energy to it yeah, it's yeah. just got a special energy to it man it's a Definitely. fascinating place yeah, and i yeah. hope you get to go out there yeah yeah uh, I'd, I'd love to to go there i've not been there myself um i was in peru last year went to machu picchu and uh nice. and nice. i did did some ayahuasca which i had which i Ooh. might talk to you about one day we'll, we'll have to get into that next time yeah maybe maybe there'll be another time on that one i haven't actually talked about that on this podcast so yeah. <laughs> maybe that'll be my opportunity but well, i'm happy um, to, I'll, happy I'll to let come you back go. i don't want to keep you too long <laughs> no i mean yeah. if we, if we'd started a bit earlier i probably would stay on but I, i've got to get to get a bed i know I think, I'm up early I think tomorrow, but... we could wrap this up because i think it's been fascinating there's definitely more to touch on if we ever get another chance to do this but um yeah, uh, I guess just to to end, uh, people can find you on the Project Unity site. And is there anywhere anywhere else? Or uh, well, if you want to follow me on Twitter, where yeah. I'm ninety five percent of the time informative, five percent of the time a bit of a douchebag, then you can follow <laughs> me on Twitter. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna just be brutally honest because social media brings out the worst in everyone, and it does occasionally bring out the worst in me. Um, but yeah, I, I'm on Twitter, um, and uh, that's at the project unity um youtube channels project unity you can email me if you want to email me uh that's at j dot unity at protonmail.com um you can send me an email if you want to reach out and uh yeah thank you for having me on man i've really enjoyed it it's nice because we 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 went into a lot of different subjects and that's what i like doing because sometimes um i don't know sometimes people think 
you only have one thing in your wheelhouse and like, you know they treat me like i'm a vending machine for ufos like you know you just press a number and i'm just going to blur out some next thing as i like, i have a lot of interests and i have a lot of you know concerns and a lot yeah. of things that i want to talk about you've brought up a good majority of the things that i genuinely <clears throat> like to think about but don't necessarily discuss as much mm -hmm. just because and as they say I it's, it's all connected <laughs> It, well, it is all connected and not enough people really see that. And so they get upset when you try and bring in other things. And I think if people just see the bigger picture, they'll they'll realize a lot of this stuff uh, is, is intrinsically connected and a lot of it just has to do with power. Um, but yeah, really good talk, man. I had a great time. Would be happy to come back again. And, uh, and I just want to thank you and all your listeners. Keep doing what you're doing, man. We need voices. We need voices.